Our final speaker this afternoon is Juan Enriquez. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to describe what he does, but he is working on what's next in a whole different frontier of mapping and seeing the world differently. Juan, where are you? One side or the other? Okay, better welcome him. Here he is. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you, Juan. Thank you. Okay, enough? Good. All right, so I know what you're thinking. Nothing like a lecture on gene research to wake up the afternoon. So, I want to convince you that early maps don't look like much, but they end up changing the world. So this is one of the first maps done, Island of Hispaniola, 1492, and eventually it became a map that looked like that. And what we're doing today is we're drawing maps with different ways. So I want to talk to you about three different maps. I want to talk to you about maps done with alphabets, maps done with genes, and maps done with brains. And I think as you think of what's happened to this room, the first map has already changed this world. It's what you do. The second map is what's changing the world, and the third map is something that looks like that early map of Hispaniola, today Dominican Republic, and Haiti. So alphabets are maps of knowledge, genes are maps of life, and brains may be maps of consciousness. So let me start unpacking that. The difference between ourselves and a monkey is about less than 0.1% of gene code. You often see that in Washington. <laughs> and, and as you're thinking, yeah. But the real difference between ourselves and monkeys is we code. And this is one of the first examples of coding. So what are we doing here? Well, we're telling people, look, this is how many of us there are, this is what we eat, this is how we dress, this is how we have a baby, this is the fish we eat, and you just learned a whole lot about what was happening in Argentina 2,000 years ago. So by coding, what we're able to do is we're able to teach the next generation, the next generation, the next generation, a whole lot of stuff. And the history of wealth has been a history of code, because code keeps changing. So as we stylize that code, and make it half a drawing, half a hieroglyph, half a letter, what we've done is we've had this history of taking these symbols and making them more and more abstract until we get to something that looks like this. And the reason why these 26 letters in English or 29 letters in Spanish or as many letters as you have in different alphabets are so important is because they allow you to code, they allow you to concentrate knowledge they allow you to build big libraries that tell people, look, this is what we learned in 1400s, this is what we learned in the 1500s, this is what we learned over the last few years. And it's this ability to code that allows us to concentrate, apply, learn, transmit data. And what's happened, the history of the last 40 years, has been a history of a change in alphabet. So when I was in high school, almost nobody was using this digital code. When I was in college, very few people were using this digital code. Today, 99% of the world is using this code. And what it does is it takes those ABCs and it transmits it in a two-letter alphabet. So if I send you the first line of code right here, you're going to get a message that says, I love you, on your cell phone. If I send you the second line of code, then you get a message that says, I hate you. Difference between love and hate? green or orange. Very different reaction. But these ones and zeros are really important because all of a sudden you don't need a separate alphabet for Chinese or Japanese or Cyrillic or Aramaic. Every alphabet, every word written and spoken in the world is now in a two-letter alphabet. And what you can't do with words you can do with ones and zeros because all of a sudden, every image, every photograph, every film, every video, every bit of music is in a two-letter alphabet. So this two-letter alphabet turns out to be incredibly powerful. You can carry most of the world's knowledge in your pocket, have more information than a president had 20 years ago because all of you have become digital citizens. So if this is so powerful, why weren't we using it? 
well, this was five megabytes in 1956. <laughs> so this is one photograph on your cell phone. And it only cost you a million dollars. Well, guess what? Not a lot of digital photographers. But the next year, two photographs, $500,000. Next year, four photographs, $250,000. Next year, eight photographs, $125,000. How much did your last thousand digital photographs cost you? You don't even count it. So these systems, just like that first map of Hispaniola, take a while to get started, but once they get started, it has an enormous impact on humans. These maps are possible because of things like this. So this is one of the patents for the very early computer chips, right? And, and in 1959, it didn't seem very relevant. And then it goes forward, and it took, oh, about eight years, nine years, for this to start birthing these little tiny startups that seemed irrelevant. Certainly didn't seem relevant to mapping at that point. And I got to tell you, it isn't a coincidence that Jack and Laura showed up at Harvard's Graduate School of Design right in between there. And just as these things are getting started, there's a professor or two there who say, you know, you might want to look at this computer stuff. And you might want to look at the applications of this to design. And it was one of those very, very early maps where it was just the outline of what would become the Americas. Fast forward this, takes a long time, 1981. Then you start getting command lines that look like this. And that's the year that Microsoft licenses to IBM the Microsoft DOS system. It didn't seem like a big deal to IBM. If IBM had realized what it was doing, it would be the most dominant computer company in the world, as opposed to Microsoft. And, oh, by the way, that's also the year that Jack and Laura decided to sell their software and not just be a consulting firm, and they were able to sell four entire copies of ARC Info. Four. And it didn't seem like this was going to change the world. It didn't seem like we were going to end up in a room with a few of our friends. And it didn't seem like those chips were going to become billion transistor chips with several layers at a 13 nanometer resolution. It takes a while for these maps to get started, but once they get started, they get really powerful. Everything every one of you does, everything is leveraging ones and zeros. Everything you've seen over the entire day is possible because you have all changed your alphabets, you're no longer drawing by hand, you're no longer using protractors, you've all become digital citizens and you're all literate in the digital world. And if I'd stood here back at the first conference and said the biggest single driver of the global economy is gonna be your ability to use ones and zeros, it might have seemed a little preposterous. So why is this important today? Why should you pay attention to this? Because we're changing the dominant alphabet again. Because we're starting to read, write, use a completely different alphabet. So this is an alphabet that was discovered by, oh, Darwin and Mendel and a whole series of other folks. And then Watson Crick came up with this argument that all life is coded in DNA. So what does that mean? It means you've got a little spiral staircase, and it's got four chemicals on it. It's got adenine, theanine, guanine, cytosine. Every life form on this planet, every sheep, every cow, every tree, every clover, every bacteria, every monkey, every human being, every politician, they're all made of this stuff. And when you look at this stuff, what you can do is you can write out that code in the same way as you write out those 11011111. So this thing executes code. This is a computer. But it executes life code. It doesn't execute digital code. How does this work? It sits up on a tree minding its own business until one day it does. Kerplop. 
And when it does that, that's like pushing execute on your computer program. And it begins to execute code, first line of code, T-A-A-C-A-A-G-G. That means make a little root. T-C-G-A, make a little stem. G-C-T-A, make some leaves. A-C-G-G, make some flowers. G-C-A-A, make a couple more of these things. Remember what happened with those ones and zeros? Zero, one, 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 I love you. Oh, one, 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 I hate you. Very different outcome depending on the order of those ones and zeros. Same thing with this. If I change some lines of code in this and say G-A-A-C-T-T-T instead of what's on there, then this thing becomes a tangerine. G-C-A-A, it becomes a lemon. C-G-A-T-C-C-C, it becomes a grapefruit. Very small changes in code have a huge impact on how life executes. In fact, the difference between you and the person sitting next to you today is about one in a thousand of those letters. Change one in a thousand of those letters, you become the person sitting next to you. Be more careful where you sit next time. <laughs> so it turns out that life is code. And if life is code, it means in the same way as you can do it with the alphabet for ABCs, or in the same way as you can do it with ones and zeros, you can read the code, you can copy the code, you can edit the code. And that's going to change the world, because just as happened in the digital revolution, the cost of understanding life code has just dropped like a rock. First human genome, billion bucks. Current human genome, about a thousand bucks. Dropping about 50% faster in Moore's Law. You can't build computers fast enough to store this stuff, to analyze it, to triage it. That's why the world's biggest IT companies are becoming life science companies. And as you're looking at this stuff, let me just give you a sense of the kinds of maps that I think are going to be interesting to you and the kinds of people who are going to be in this room as your world and the life science world converge over the next decade or two. So these are all the chromosomes, 23. And the one tiny little runt over there is what makes people male. It's recessive, it's mutant, and it's sometimes useless. <laughs> but hey. And as you're looking at this stuff, you can map it at very different resolutions. So you can take the human Y chromosome, and you can break it down and say, hey, here's one section, here's another section, and then you can zoom in and look very specifically at each of those ATCGs on this stuff. And then you can look and say, hey, when you've got a form of leukemia, these are some of the changes that you have in this code. These are some of the things that are misspelled or misplaced or edited in or edited out. And then you can get very, very specific on this. You personally have this form of colon cancer. And this is what this is doing to you. And this is the medicine you should think about using. These are early maps. Right? We're not at the stage where we can build medicines for all of these things, but we're starting to build medicines for some of these things. It also teaches us a whole lot, not just about humans, but about other things. So you can take something like cholera and figure out exactly what it is within cholera that makes it much more toxic over here, less toxic over here, comes from Africa, you can, you can type exactly where that cholera came from, and by the way, you can compare it to tuberculosis. So what is it in this disease that makes it particularly nasty or particularly virulent? What does it do across all flus? And as you begin to map this stuff, you can go micro and you can go macro. These are basically all the forms of life on Earth on a big scale. When they arose, what came from what, and what the size of the genomes are. So that's what we know about life on the planet in one graph at this stage. The maps get interesting. Just like you're layering maps, this is huge amounts of data being layered. Because, see, the gene letters down here turn into sentences, which are the metabolites up here. And they turn into paragraphs. I'm sorry, the senses are the, are the proteins. And then they turn into metabolites, which are the paragraphs. 
And these are really interesting, really complex maps. And if you tweak them at the gene level, you're going to have effects all the way up. And if you tweak them at the protein level, you're going to have effects all the way up. And if you tweak them over at the metabolite level, you're going to have effects all the way up, right? So it's like playing a multi-dimensional chess game. These are some of the most interesting, complex, interesting, just fascinating mapping problems on the planet today. Talking about geographic information systems, looking at protein-protein interactions, we don't have computers powerful enough to model this today. This is what's pushing high-end computing. This is what's pushing high-end AI. These are problems that are just absolutely fascinating, and they're problems of maps. And I think in the next decade, you're going to have a whole pile of people asking you, so how did you map this? How did you visualize it? And by the way, some of your kids, if they choose to enter mapping and high-end mapping, may want to ask questions about life sciences as well. So that's the mapping part. Let me talk about consequences. So see, the old biology used to be reactive. You used to take your little magnifying glass or microscope and sort of look at what was there. The new gene biology is proactive. You make stuff with it. Once you have the map, then you know how to explore. Once you know how to explore, you know how to change the place. So what we've done is we've taken the rules of what lives and dies on Earth for four billion years, which Darwin and Wallace established, and we flipped the logic of evolution completely on its head. So the old evolution used to be natural selection, random mutation. The new evolution, driven by humans, creates a parallel system, different from that of nature, that's unnatural selection, non-random mutation. So let me unpack that. Natural selection is a wolf. You domesticate a wolf, you start breeding a wolf, and you get unnatural selection, and it looks like that. <laughs> and basically what you're doing is you're saying, hey, I'm going to breed this one to be a Labrador. I'm going to breed this one to be a Doberman. I'm going to breed this one to be a Bloodhound. This is not natural selection. Take one of those little yapping chihuahuas that you found over here on Rodeo Drive in Los Angeles, put it on the African plane, you will watch natural selection happen really quickly. <laughs> a cornfield is the least natural space on Earth. Leave a cornfield fallow. It will not look like a cornfield. Plants don't normally grow like amber waves of grain. Absent human intervention, the types of things that would occur on half the surface of the planet wouldn't occur because we we like snakes less, we like dogs more, we like cats, we like corn, we like flowers. So we're deciding what lives and dies, not necessarily nature. And so we've taken mustard weed, and when you suppress the flowers, you get broccoli. When you get bigger leaves, you get kale. When you sterilize the flowers, you get cauliflower. These are non-random mutations. And we're getting better and better at reading this language of life, copying it, and editing it, which some people might call intelligent design, to pick a completely random phrase. <laughs> Let me give you a second example of how this is working. A company I co-founded a few years ago with the man who sequenced the human genome, Craig Venter, and Hamilton Smith, who got the Nobel for Restriction Enzymes, basically wanted to map the smallest living organism and do this. And I know this picture is wildly exciting to all of you. It only took us about $40 million in four years to do the, take that picture. But basically what we did is we took the entire program out of the cell and put in a completely different program. And so that's the world's first synthetic life form, which some people thought was a big deal. In fact, it was a science discovery of the year. And what we can now do is we can take that code and change that code in the same way as you rewrite a sentence or rewrite a paragraph or rewrite a book. And we can stick that code in a little green soup. And the cool thing is scale. No matter how I program a cell phone, I'm not going to have a 1,000 cell phones. But if I program green soup, it becomes this. And then if you go into our greenhouses, which are 
just up the road here in La Jolla, it becomes this, and then you stick it in a plastic bag, and then you come back a few days later, and guess what? And what we've now done is we've now started thinking, could we make this on a big scale? So we're thinking of making something basically that goes to the mountains. And that's the reason why you're seeing all these Exxon ads that are talking about making energy out of algae. That's one of our partnerships. Maybe we can make a close to carbon neutral fuel. And see, the interesting thing is it's not just about making energy. Programmable life forms can make almost anything. It can change agriculture on a massive scale. You can produce an enormous amount of protein or oil or fiber on a tenth to a fiftieth the surface area of current agricultural structures. You can store information, basically the Library of Congress, in half a glass of water. You can make a bird flu vaccine and ship it via a programmable fax in a very short period of time. And this is stuff that we're beginning to do on a large scale because we've made the printers, we're shipping the printers to program life forms. They're about the size of a color printer. Which takes me to my last point. We are now probably at a stage where we can remake almost every one of our body parts. We can take the code that's in each of our cells, which is the human genome, and the human genome, each of your cells, knows exactly how to make every single one of your body parts. Let me put it in terms of a baby. You were all born with no teeth, and your mothers were most grateful. <laughs> and then you grew a set of teeth, and then you gave them to the tooth fairy. And then guess what? You grew a second set of teeth. But then you went and played hockey and lost a couple of teeth. Well, here's the weird part. If your body knows how to make a full set of teeth and did so once and did so twice, and you have the gene code in each of your cells, why can't you make a third set of teeth? Well, you can. And by the way, in the same way as you can remake your bones when you break them, or your skin when you get burned, we're learning how to make kidneys how to make tracheas, how to make bladders, how to make eyes, because the code necessary to do that is in each of your cells. Your body knows how to make your body. As we learn how to recode, how to execute code, we can remake, over the next few decades, every single one of your body parts. Except one, the brain. So the great challenge to living more than 120, 140 years, a challenge which I think is going to take us centuries, not decades, is mapping the brain. And these brain maps are getting more and more sophisticated, but they're way behind the maps you do. They're way behind the genome maps. So I think the absolute cutting edge of map making and what will be in this room not in 10 years, but in 30 years, has to do with mapping the brain. And some of these maps are absolutely fascinating. So if you actually map the human body as to how connected is it to the brain, this is how connected each of your body parts is to the brain. You can go online, start looking at these maps, start learning this stuff. Very, very cool stuff. And I'll close by telling you something that we're trying to build to map the brain. So this incredible woman, Mary Lou Jepsen, one of the greatest inventors, academics, engineers in the world, had a brain tumor. And she said, you know what? I'm going to learn a whole lot about the brain. In fact, I'm going to map the brain. And what she wants to do is she wants to create the equivalent of a ski cap that operates like an MRI. So the vision of this thing is to build a technology platform that's non-invasive, that allows mapping and communicating with your brain by basically wearing a ski cap. 
That substitutes for a $6 million machine that most hospitals don't have. And by the way, she wants to do it at $1,000 instead of $6 million, and she wants to have a billion fold of resolution. These are going to be some of the most interesting maps and intricate maps humans have ever built. Because it's not just mapping neuron by neuron, it's mapping the millions and billions of connections between each of a cluster of neurons. We've built the lab size prototype. We should have consumer kits within the next three years. And that is going to unleash one of the greatest mapping adventures humans have ever been in, because this is a map of what makes us human. We have to think about not just the science, we have to think about how this changes countries, how it changes industries, how it changes ethics, how we should think about this stuff, how we should control it. And all of you have an enormous knowledge of all of these things. What can you do with maps for good and for ill? How do we think about new maps? How do we teach kids to use new maps? How do we establish rules and ethics for the use of information? I want you and your kids to be part of this adventure. This is absolutely the greatest time to be alive. There's a whole lot of problems in the world. There's a whole lot of violence. There's a little bit of political squabbling. That is irrelevant compared to some of these journeys of exploration, because when this era is remembered, it's going to be remembered as the era where we started to learn life code and brain code, as well as a whole host of other things. And you and your kids are going to be the explorers. So faced with that future, there's only two things that matter. Nike and Nissan. So just do it and enjoy the ride. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for sharing what your vision is. Uh, futurist, visionary, Juan Enrique. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And what would you have them do? Are you going to recruit them to, into your labs? You know, I, I left academia a while ago because I wanted to build companies. I think these companies, they're a little bit like yours. You know, they have a vision of what the power of information and knowledge sharing and mapping can do. And they give some of the smartest people in the world an opportunity to go out and apply that knowledge, build that knowledge. Create, create the future. Knowledge. And it's, it, this is just a great adventure. And, you know, all of you are going to be at the forefront of some of this. And it's very cool. So you are a good friend of E.O. Wilson as well. Yes. So he says, save half the world in total, totally protected areas. What is your thought? So I'd been less ambitious. I'd say save a quarter, but I <laughs> love the idea of saving a half the world because I think it's irresponsible for humans to say I'm going to determine what lives and dies on most of the planet. And I think we have to let nature operate without human intervention in the rainforests, in parts of the ocean. You know. It's very nice to live in our suburbs, in our countryside, in our national parks. But I'd like to preserve a whole bunch of places in the world so that the natural evolutionary system continues just in the small chance that we make a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> this is very, you're scaring me, Juan. <laughs> Juan, thank you very much. Thank you. Juan is going to be around tonight. He has an exciting new book. Evolving ourselves. You can meet him personally. Thank you very much. Thank you.